Hi, everyone. My name is Sylvia Miller, and I'm Senior Program Manager for Scholarly Publishing and Special Projects at the Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are this morning, afternoon, or evening. And many thanks to our co-hosts, the Duke University Libraries, and our co-sponsors, the Department of African and African American Studies, and the Department of Art History and Visual Studies for spreading the word about this event. Now, it's my pleasure to turn it over to our moderator, Professor Jasmine Cobb, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for Faculty Book Watch at the Franklin Humanities Institute. And thank you to our co-hosts, the Duke University Libraries and our co-sponsors, the Department of African and African-American Studies and the Department of Art, Art History and Visual Studies. My name is Jasmine Nicole Cobb, the Baca Foundation Associate Professor of Art, Art History and Visual Studies in African and African-American Studies. Uh, I'm moderating today's meeting, which is our second convening to discuss new work by our colleague, Richard J. Powell, the John Spencer Bassett Professor of Art and Art History at Duke University. Professor Powell is a recognized authority on African-American art and culture. He has organized numerous art exhibitions, most notably the Blues Aesthetic, Black Culture and Modernism, Rhapsodies in Black, Art of the Harlem Renaissance, to Conserve a Legacy, American Art at Historically Black Colleges and Universities, Back to Black, Art, Cinema, and the Racial Imaginary, and Archibald Motley, Jazz Age Modernist. Along with teaching courses in American Art, the Arts of the African Diaspora, and Contemporary Visual Studies, he has also written extensively on topics ranging from primitivism to postmodernism, including such titles as Homecoming, The Art and Life of William H. Johnson, Black Art, A Cultural History, Cutting a Figure, Fashioning Black Portraiture, and most recently, Going There, Black Visual Satire, which examines satirical cartoons, paintings, films, and videos by modern and contemporary African-American artists. Our conversation today focuses on the art of Ollie Harrington, whose materials are part of the illustrious collection of art and objects by Dr. Walter O. Evans. Dr. Evans retired as a surgeon in Detroit, Michigan to his place of birth, Savannah, Georgia in 2001. Shortly after he began his surgical practice in 1976, he began collecting African-American art. His first purchase was a suite of 22 silk screens, The Legend of John Brown by Jacob Lawrence. Over the next 25 years that he resided in Detroit, he would go on to collect more than 400 original paintings and sculpture by artists such as Lawrence, Romare Bearden, Aaron Douglas, Richard Hunt, Elizabeth Catlett, Charles White, Edward M. Bannister, Robert S. Duncanson, Mary Edmonia Lewis, among many others, including many that were commissioned by some of these artists. In 1991, he and his wife, Linda, established a traveling exhibition of approximately 80 of these works, which traveled to more than 50 museums throughout the US and over the following 15 years. In addition to collecting art, Dr. Evans collected first edition books, manuscripts, letters, and documents relating to the African-American experience. These original letters and documents include the original papers of Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, James Weldon Johnson, and others. In 2004, Evans and his wife donated approximately 70 works of art to the SCAD Museum of Art in Savannah. Dr. Evans serves on the board of several art organizations, including the Board of Visitors at SCAD, the De Detroit Institute of Arts, and is president of the Jacob and Gwendolyn Lawrence Foundation. So I'm really thrilled to moderate this conversation today because you all represent multiple yet interlocking ways of knowing Ollie Harrington. Uh, chapter two of Going There gives us insight into an African-American artist creating work in the World War II era 
navigating issues of nationalism, militarism, and protest, but also the study of fine art, immigration to Paris, and art making in East Germany. Professor Powell uncovers Harrington's artwork while also giving us two gems of theoretical insight. The idea that jive can be a visual phenomena as well as literary and performative, and then the practice of satiracy, literacy in understanding the satirical as a way of understanding that traverses local spaces of black folk culture and international art making abroad. Going there gives us a chance to engage Harrington for all his many points of relevance. And so I wanna ask both to, through the conversation and through various points, I'll move in and out to just help us and understand, understanding who is Ollie Harrington, both as folks would have come to him as an artist in his time. And now as we come to him looking back from the point of Dr. Evans' archive. Thank you, Jasmine, for that uh, wonderful and generous introduction. And I'll make my comments fairly brief on um, why I included a chapter on Oliver Ollie Harrington. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, he's an American master. Um, we know that PBS has this series that they do on, and they've done for a number of years about great American artists and intellectuals and contributors to American culture. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that um, Ollie Harrington is, again, an American master, an extraordinary uh, cartoonist, uh, an amazing personality who makes his way uh, through the 20th century, uh, experiencing uh, the, the Jazz Age, Harlem Renaissance, the Great Depression, uh, World War II, um, the um, Black expatriate experience in Paris, um, living behind the, the Iron Curtain uh, in East Berlin. And, and I just feel blessed that not only did I have an opportunity to write about him, but that um, uh, without Ali Harrington, we have uh, in, our, in our midst, Dr. Walter O. Evans, who, who knew him, who was his major patron, and can provide the insights and the kind of backstory for this really incredible person. So um, as I said, he's an American master. Um, Walter, do you do, can you add to that a little bit? Well, yes. Um, first, I'd like to say that um, I didn't know Ollie Harrington when doing my early days here in the Deep South, but I was looking at what we called in our household, the funnies. My father would um, hand the funnies to me every Sunday and the rest of the family would go through the, uh, the paper. And he told me that um, not to read certain funnies. Uh, one would have been um, Barney Google because they had a character in there named Al uh, Alabaster. And you can imagine what he looked like. And uh, it was stereotypical. Or uh, the Cats and Jammer kids because they had a group of characters there occasionally um, that were cannibals and you can imagine what they looked like. But by telling me not to do it, I read them anyway. But it wasn't until later uh, when my family moved north uh, to Hartford, Connecticut that uh, I would have seen the Pittsburgh Courier. Um, and uh, that would have been the first time that I had seen Bootsy. But I didn't know what I didn't know anything about Ollie Harrington. That didn't come until many years later when I began collecting, as Jasmine said, uh, uh, following uh, my, uh, my residency and, and my, the beginning of my practice in surgery in Detroit. Uh, at that time, I began um, calling and uh, as much as I could buying works by African-American artists and um, books and manuscripts by African-American writers, and I would invite them to Detroit. Well, at some point, I learned about Holly Harrington from reading uh, Chester Himes and, and uh, Elton Fax uh, and others. Uh, so it would have been in the late 80s that I said, I wondered if this man was still alive. And lo and behold, I got in touch with um, 
uh, some of his friends in New York, Esther and, and Jim Jackson. And they told me not only was he alive, but he was living in East Berlin and they gave me his uh, contact information. So I wrote him a letter asking would he come. Um, and it took a couple months before I got an answer, but he said, yes, he would come. At that time, this, this would have been in 91. And at that time I had already been inviting on average two luminaries, that is uh, artists and um, our writers to come to Detroit and I would share them with the broader community. So that's where um, my interest in Ali came from, uh, beginning in the um, uh, 80s and actually extend, extending that further by inviting him to Detroit in, the, in 1991. You see, Jasmine, you know, what makes Walter so amazing is that he had been immersed in the, the, the greats, Romy Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, Elizabeth Catlett, Richard Hunt. In other words, you know, the, the, the academically approved and understood, yeah. you know, great African-American artists. But it takes somebody with an imagination to say, well, there's this black cartoonist, you know, he's just as important as these other artists. And so Walter, I mean, as I said, I've, I've known Walter for a number of years now. And I've always been amazed that he has a vision and he looks at things that other people don't necessarily look at and he recognizes them for their importance. For sure. I, the, the collection to think of Harrington situated amongst other people in uh, Walter's collection, it really helps us understand his significance at the time he's working, but also in hindsight to think of him alongside literary figures like Richard Wright and artists like Elizabeth Catlett. Absolutely. And I think that when I was working on uh, going there, Black visual satire, I had actually done the outlines for the introduction for the chapter on, um, on the 60s and 70s, um, uh, the minstrel stain. Uh, and I had done uh, a, uh, an extended um, uh, piece on, on a, a, a Robert Colescott. But then I realized there was something missing. <laughs> and, and, and looking at some of the uh, publications that uh, Walter had been very involved with, um, kind of bringing the art of Ali Harrington to the fore basically got me going. And I said, okay, there's no way I can complete this book without including a chapter on, on, um, on Oliver Harrington. So again, thanks to Walter, he introduces me and us to, to this artist through his collection. And then, you know, you just start to go a little deeper. And the deeper and deeper you go, you realize that this is an artist who isn't just kind of um, on one level, it's you have to go beneath the surface. And you start to get into this interesting history, you know, around um, Black culture, Black visual culture in the early uh, mid 20th century. And you start to learn not just about kind of broad cultural kind of parameters, but you begin to deal with politics and you begin to deal with this kind of geopolitical uh, energy that, 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 that he is kind of a part of that, that kind of moves him from the US to France and ultimately uh, to Berlin. And then actually Walter is a part of the story as well because it's through Walter that, that, that Ali comes back to the United States um, in the, uh, in the 90s um, um, and, and is able to reconnect with, with, with a very different America uh, than the one that he left uh, in, uh, in the early 50s. Did you, were you aware of the Harrington's materials that were in Walter's collection uh, when you started looking at him or were you going off of what you had access to on your own? Well, what I'd like to do is share um, the PowerPoint let me do that. And I'll show you some of the things that really kind of got me inspired. Um, well, first of all, you've got to see this image on the left, which is, uh, which is like classic Ollie Harrington, you know, um, using the icon of the Statue of Liberty, but, 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 but using the metaphor of extinguishing, you know, the flames of democracy um, via the Klan. And, and, and again, there's that kind of edgy part of who, who Ali Harrington was. Uh, let me kind of forward here. 
And um, we, we've talked about um, Walter's amazing collection, um, his, his work uh, with his wife, Linda Evans, uh, um, um, his connections to David Blight at Yale and their work around um, um, Frederick Douglass, his, his papers and archives and his, his important collection. But you mentioned, Jasmine, you know, the kinds of materials that got me fired up. The first book that I, I found was the, the, called Bootsy, the cartoons of, of, of Ollie Harrington, a book that was published um, um, in the, in the late 1950s with an introduction by Langston Hughes. But again, thanks to Walter, we have these two other books that, that come out in the early 1990s. Um, one, uh, Why I Left America and Other Essays, and the other, uh, Dark Laughter, the Satiric Art of Ol Oliver W. Harrington. So, so these are kind of the first texts, at least in our era, that are beginning to dig deeper into his work. Um, a, a professor, um, um, Thomas uh, Inge, uh, was, was, was the primary author on, on, on these um, introductory books to him. But as I said, you start to learn this story and you learn about this um, guy who's hanging out with Richard Wright uh, in Paris in the 1950s and, and in conversation with, with, um, with Orson Welles uh, in the 1940s and doing work for Adam Clayton Powell. And, uh, and, and you begin to realize that this is a big story. And so I'd say that it was that, um, the, the, the breadth of that, as well as these powerful, um, delightful cartoons that really got me fired up. And Walter mentions access to the funnies you know, as a, as a child, which I think is such a, a, a great starting point for thinking about what Harrington is able to do. Because as you share with us in the book, Rick, what he experiences in childhood is a part of his introduction into this kind of image making. Yes, born in the Bronx to a African-American father from Henderson, North Carolina. Uh, and a Jewish Hungarian mother, um, and uh, he had he was one of seven um, siblings uh, living in the Bronx. <laughs> um, when you read that book um, that Walter put together, um, Oliver t uh, it facetiously talks about how the, the the horses of the Sheffield Farm Dairy in the Bronx had cozier uh, <laughs> uh, conditions for for themselves than the poor black folks who lived uh, in the Bronx during that time period. And um, a, a great, great work from, from Walter's collection is the image in the upper left where you know, he's attending schools uh, in New York during these years and racism is blatant. Racism is just in your face. And the teacher, Mrs. McCoy, you know, says, you know, you're trash, you don't belong in this class. And he's devastated. If you can imagine a black child having to go through that. So he goes home and he takes out his pencil and paper and says, oh, let me do some drawing. Okay, Miss McCoy being run over by the train. Miss McCoy being put through, through a meat grinder. Miss McCoy being, being, being doing pain and assault to herself the way that she did pain and assault to me as, as a child in these schools. And he realized that he could do these cartoons that, that were kind of cathartic that were kind of restorative, that really kind of gave him back a kind of a, a sense of agency and control. And, and also he had talent connected to that, um, that he perfected at um, New York Textile High School, that he, um, that he honed hanging out with people in Harlem. Um, I'm sure Walter can tell us some anecdotes about um, some of those early years that, that, uh, Walt, that uh, Ali might have shared with him about um, living in, in, in Harlem in this period. Well, you mentioned um, uh, Miss McCoy, and he gave a speech when he first came to, um, he gave several speeches, as a matter of fact, when he came to Detroit in April of 91. And I actually printed this uh, and published that speech. And I asked him uh, if he would draw me a picture of what uh, Miss McCoy looks like. And this was the commission that he did. And this was for the frontispiece of a little booklet of the speech that he did at Wayne State University. And further along, you will um, uh, see some of the photos from the time he gave that speech. Uh, but he would, he would tell these stories, um, as uh, Rick has mentioned. Um, 
about Miss McCoy, but also after he graduated from high school, he went to live at the uh, 135th Street YMCA in, um, in Harlem um, before uh, be going to uh, college. And he said, and these are his words, paraphrased, that he did not have to go out looking for his comic material. It came to him every day as he walked the streets of Harlem. And that's really how Bootsy was born. But he went through several iterations of his comic strips before he got to Bootsy. And, but he never had to look for materials. It was always there in front of him. I'm glad you brought up um, how um, culture is, is a kind of a funnel for ideas and, and, and source material. Uh, I'm thinking about what Ishmael Reed years ago said that, that the black experience is surreal. And, and so you don't have to look for surrealism in France. All you have to do is go to Harlem, go to the South side of Chicago, go yeah. to uh, Georgia Avenue in Washington DC and pick up on those stories and those anecdotes. Uh, I'm gonna show a picture, an early, early work of, of, of Harrington's in a few minutes, but it's worth mentioning that his earliest mentor was George S. Schuyler. Uh, who was who was this wild character uh, during this time period? He uh, wrote a book called Black No More, which was a kind of an introductory satirical work of art about what happens if a doctor, a, med a, a scientist, discovers a an elixir that can turn black people white. <laughs> What's going to happen? And this was written in like the early 1930s. Um, the irony of George Schuyler is that at this time he is editor. At a, at, at, a, at a paper in New York um, called the uh, National News. And so he, he contracts Ali Harrington to start doing these cartoons in the early 1930s, like the one Raspberry Salad on the left. And, um, and as you said, you're really getting this kind of flavor, this kind of color, this local color of, of, of black culture. But of course, his penultimate character that he perfects um, after leaving the National News and then moving on to the Amsterdam news is Bootsy, who is this kind of every man or this every black man. He uh, is, um, he's, he's not in the best of health, <laughs> I'll put it like that. Uh, he um, uh, picks up on stuff that's happening in the streets. Um, he often is the butt of people's jokes, but he's also a witness to, 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 the, to, to the surrealness of black life uh, in Harlem. Uh, during this time period. And so um, I almost see this, this character as, as, as a kind of a, I, I would call him a doppelganger, except that Ali Harrington was so smooth and so suave, but maybe he still was a doppelganger because not everybody, or even in our best moments, we sometimes you know, fall flat on our faces. And I think that, that Ali might've seen Bootsy as a kind of a, uh, an extension of him uh, uh, in, 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 in behavior and in observations, if not physically. That's a wonderful contrast because I think, you know, caricature and cartooning, um, especially as it's accessible through newspapers, um, seems uh, sort of uh, quotidian and every day, right? It starts with his doodling and his notebook. But as we see in the detail of the works and the length of his career, he's a quite sophisticated artist. And uh, sharing his Yale time really helps us understand the labor that went into his craft. Yeah, and Yale was um, an extraordinary experience for him. Um, he um, was one of several black students in those years. His roommate was Owen Dotson, the very important future um, um, theater um, person, impresario, director. He taught at Howard for many, many years and they roomed together and they also bust tables together um, for the fraternities, the white fraternities uh, at, at mm -hmm. Yale. And um, again, they're, they're listening, they're quiet, but they're picking up on all the anecdotes, but they're also having fun like young men will do. Um, they had a car, an old beat up car that they called Nimrod, and they would drive that car down to the pin relays uh, in Philadelphia. They would go to Harlem, um, they would go on uh, double dates and they would just have a really, really good time and they would pick up on, on the things and the people that they saw uh, in Harlem. And one of the things that I discussed 
uh, in the book is that um, it also speaks to uh, a kind of a breadth of, 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 of acknowledgement and appreciation for the complexity of blackness because Owen Dotson was gay and, and Ali Harrington kind of, I believe, picked up on that. And, and yet they were able to kind of share a kind of a common understanding and appreciation for difference and for insight, being able to look and understand and experience people and to see people on multiple levels. And uh, so, so, so it's quite um, um, poignant that, 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 that through his connections with this theater person that, that he too kind of understands the theater of, of, of Black America. For sure. I think it, there's also a certain theater um, to, to Black life in the World War II era, right? If we think about all the kinds of reporting and image making and representation happening at this time. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm showing a picture of, of Ali Harrington that I just downloaded the other day on, on the internet. Um, he was part of a, of a film that was done in 1944, just as he's returning from his war correspondence work. And, um, and he was very proud to be in uniform. He was very proud to work with other black soldiers um, to not only draw them, but to write about their stories for the Pittsburgh Courier and for the People's Voice, um, Adam Clayton Powell's uh, newspaper uh, at the time. And, and, and I would say that Ali has this amazing breadth um, he can be, on one hand, quite serious and moved by the contributions of, of Black soldiers, but he can also have fun with the Black experience as seen in Bomb Shelter, where, where the zoot suits and the big hats and the baggy pants, you know, could be, could be kind of looked at kind of comically or, and ironically with these two kids amazed at this, at this guy walking um, through with his, his zoot suit and the like. So, so, so it takes... It takes someone to have that kind of breadth and, and appreciation for the culture to both celebrate it and to delightfully critique it. Which th these illustrations, I think, really complicate, you know, a facile understanding of uh, Harrington as an artist at this time. Absolutely. Um, one of the moments uh, that's an epiphany moment, I would say, uh, and, and, and perhaps Walter can say a little bit about this since he was in conversation with Ali, you know, in many years later was when um, Ali worked for the NAACP and um, in communications. And he becomes uh, very involved with um, a case of Isaac Woodard, um, who was a black vet who was traveling by bus um, from, I think, uh, Augusta, through South Carolina, basically somewhere in that part of the world, and um, was um, and the bus driver um, was angry with this with Isaac Woodard for wanting to stop, um, and um, so the bus driver calls up the police in one of the towns in that part of the world, and they drag him off of the bus. They beat him. They beat him to the point that he's blind, that he can no longer see, and they throw him uh, in jail, and then they throw him. In, um, in, in a public hospital. And it's not until days that people find out you know, where Isaac Woodard is. And this is an incredibly horrific situation. And as you see in this photograph, Ali Harrington was very, very involved with this case, um, promoting it through the NAACP, um, actually um, giving Os Orson Welles um, stories about Isaac Woodard and the whole case that Orson Welles, the great uh, actor and radio personality during this time period, will uh, we'll do reports on um, on ABC News. Um, Walter, um, uh, Ali talked to you about this, didn't he? Ali talked to me about this on several occasions and of the dozen or so places that he gave talks in Detroit, uh, he mentioned this case where he, um, uh, where he was working for the NAACP and went down to investigate it with Orson Welles. And every time he talked about this case, uh, he uh, he would start crying. I mean, he, he became very emotional. So this um, affected him tremendously. And um, uh, he was also a witness, I don't know if you were going to mention this, another case that happened in, um, in Tennessee where, um, uh, where he investigated. Uh, it was also, I think it was a murder lynching in Tennessee that he went 
to investigate for the NACP. Uh, but this is the case, Isaac Wooded, that he talked about every single time, so much so that when I published a little booklet um, uh, that I did, uh, let's see, I dedicated it to Isaac Wooded. It was um, Where's the Justice? And that was, um, that was a booklet that was published following his talk debating uh, Tom Clark at the New York Herald Tribune in uh, 1946. It was following that talk that he actually, um, that propelled him to move to Paris. But Isaac Woodard was something that was fixed on his mind from, uh, from those early days. I'm glad you brought up the, the situation with the Attorney General because um, 21st century audiences have a hard time understanding how being political, how being pro-Black, how being an activist and being Black could get you in trouble um, in these years. And, and Ali put himself out there and was quite vocal. And because of his political connections to the Communist Party and the like, um, he, re he pretty much saw the writing on the wall. And he realized that, that, that he would not be able to remain in the United States um, um, in the beginning of the 1950s and have a full and meaningful career. So he was lucky enough to get his passport in order. And by the early 50s, he is on a one-way boat to Paris. And, and that's where we see him on the right hanging out with um, Isadora Duncan's <laughs> brother. I didn't know he was still alive in 1954. Um, you know, again, he's part of this kind of lively uh, cultural scene in Paris with Richard Wright, with Chester Himes, with James Baldwin, uh, with, um, with the whole uh, a coterie of artists and intellectuals. But Walter, as you know very well, um, Ali was the star of that event. It wasn't Richard Wright, it wasn't Chester Himes. Ali was the rencontreur. Ali was the, the kind of playboy. Um, all, of the, all, of the, all of the girls loved him <laughs> and, and, and he loved them too. And, uh, and he was also a prolific and active cartoonist during this time period, dealing with civil rights issues, dealing with bringing us back to Bootsy. Uh, and, and these are two cartoons that, that, that I've often looked at and, and laughed at, the academic uh, Jasmine on the left, <laughs> who, who thinks that, that they're going to be able to talk about interstellar gravitational tensions in thermonuclear propulsion. But instead, um, he's asked by his white cohorts to sing a Negro spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Bootsy looking at his fellow, of, or rather an African-American abstract artist, and, and the artist saying, well, you know, <laughs> you know, white folks just won't understand if you do anything that has, that has meaning and form and content, you know. So, so Ali had this incredible wry sense of humor, but, 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 the, 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 but he nails every time a kind of a poignancy. He makes a point that, 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 that is not lost on us. Absolutely. What I loved about these images when I encountered them in the book is that it said he had a point of view that wasn't limited to what's happening on the street that he is talking about sort of big ideas and issues that uh, African-Americans are confronted with in various spaces of life. Um, uh, Walter, did Ali tell you why he went to uh, Berlin? Uh, yes, he did. Um, well, he had been in Paris for approximately 10 years. He went, as you said, in uh, 1951. And Richard Wright died, uh, I believe, in uh, 1960. Um, at that time, he was sending his <clears throat> cartoons to the uh, Black press, to the Pittsburgh Courier, the New York Amsterdam News, Chicago Defender, and the Baltimore Afro-American. And uh, they would send him small checks, most of which bounce. Well, he got the offer to do some illustrating for a couple of magazines in uh, Berlin. And um, because he really wasn't making a great living in, um, he enjoyed living in Paris, but he just wasn't making the living that he would have wanted because of the irregular work. So when he went up to Berlin, the way he tells it, is that while he was there in his hotel, 
the, the Berlin Wall went up and um, he said he was stuck behind that wall. Um, I don't know how much of that is true, but uh, you know, Ali could tell some stories. And, uh, but anyway, uh, that's why he said he went to Berlin and why he stayed and never really left. And Berlin in a strange way becomes um, a, a perfect place to work in the sense of, of, of the, um, being in an environment that would not um, uh, put uh, undue uh, challenges on him because of his politics, but also um, being able to continue to send those cartoons to the black newspapers, but also beginning to do a lot of work uh, in uh, German publications as well. Um, I just wanted to quickly show these 1960s uh, cartoons that he did in Berlin. Um, Jasmine knows that I love these cartoons <laughs> deeply. And, and well, well, Jasmine, I'll let you talk about them. I love them deeply as well. I mean, to, for one, to look at the evolution of the work, right? How he is over time really saturating the frame with so much information that, you know, it, it takes away any simple understanding of what drawing and cartooning uh, can yield on the page. But Rick and I were both fawning over the, the detailed body, the corporeal position, not just of the front characters, which is catching, but even the background characters, the ways in which he gives so much detail to a neck at the center of the page turned back um, in our person speaking to the police officer. And then just from head to toe, this woman reaching into her bag you know, her body facing Bootsy, but her look far off, um, it, it's just really remarkable. And and what, and uh, Ali's depiction of that amputee. I mean, so it's one thing to be able to do anatomy of kind of idealized bodies, but to do um, a, a drawing of someone who who is physically handicapped and to give them power and to give yeah. them a sense of agency and a, and a full personality, to me, that's, that's just extraordinary. Yeah. Yes, he has might, right? His, the upper part of his body is, is in motion. Yeah, it's really yes. something. Yeah. So I, I want, we got to get through this because we got so many great images because I want Walter to really talk a little bit more about, about actually meeting Ali. And, um, but I guess I could also ask you, Walter, about your collecting of Ali, because this image on the right is a masterpiece. Um, it is. I call it the Lynch bus. <laughs> it and, is. And um, it was published in Eulenspiegel, a German publication in 1977. And, and, and so tell me about buying Ali Harrington's. Well, um, even before I met Ali, and after he had agreed to come to Detroit, I asked, could we do an exhibition of his work, which we did at the um, uh, at the uh, so at the at the museum, the Charles Wright Museum of African American History and Art, and this is one of the hundred or so works that he sent over at the time, um, which I later purchased. Uh, he told me that this piece won the Lenin Prize. I don't know whether you found any indication of that. To find out if that was true, but he told me. I saw me he, some references in some uh, German publications. Yes. Okay. Well, this one is one that he says he won won the Lenin Prize for, and this is actually the only work of Ollie Harrington out of the many that I collected that's hanging in my home today. I mean, it's it does so much for me because you know I lived through this era, the civil rights era, so. Um, but this is also one that he was very proud of. And apparently he did other versions of it, as you see in the, in the middle image here, uh, and the one uh, on the left, you see, yes. uh, you see a school bus there. So yes. all of these are related, at least three related oh, yeah. uh, images. And the one on the left is at the Library of Congress. And as you see at the bottom, it says to Esther, uh, and Jim um, with with love, um, um, Ollie, and Those were um, this is Esther Jackson and, and and Jim Jackson, who you mentioned Jackson, earlier. Right. Those were those were his uh, two of his uh, closest friends in uh, back in the states, yeah. and and who really gave me entree into uh, where Ollie was and his his information. 
these are remarkable. Uh, yeah, we, it, can, we can go on and on. Go on <laughs> I, and I, on. I feel like, <laughs> yeah. but I guess this is the one I want to end with before we get into Walter's um, 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 family album. Um, I mean, talk about an image that really kind of resonates beyond the time that it was created. Um, and also talks, makes a real profound statement about kind of black men and, and the challenges that black men face over time, not just as grown men, but as babies, as, as young people. And, um, and, and, and this had no caption other than practice makes perfect. And, 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 and it's so poignant when you, when you see it. And um, when I saw the original one um, in Eulenspiegel, when I went to Berlin to, to really locate the time for this, um, it just really underscored to me how how his how his insights translate beyond um, beyond his African American position. Yes, and how being in Germany didn't uh, remove him from the concerns of Black Americans in the U.S. And how you know even with the comic form and the introduction of color, he's able to produce a kind of darkness in the image right, through how much is there and what's going on. So it doesn't need a caption, really. You, you get mm -hmm. the sentiment that he's mm -hmm. conveying. Mm -hmm. You learn from the cradle. Yeah. In the black community. Yeah. So, so we got a family album here, Walter, uh, help us. Well, um, after uh, Ali came the first time, the first of three times that uh, I brought him over here, uh, with the help sometimes of universities in the States. Uh, Linda and I went over first to Paris to visit um, um, uh, Richard Wright's daughter, uh, Julia, and Richard Wright's widow, Ellen. Uh, but this is after we uh, left Paris and went to Berlin. And we're on, um, in the upper left there, that's uh, Ali's son, Ali Jr., Ali, myself. And below, that's Linda, my wife, um, Ollie, and young Ollie. And while we were there, <clears throat> and up, upper right, by the way, that's uh, Ollie's wife, Helma, and down below, there I am and my two daughters. So um, if you could move on. So the Berlin Wall had gone down around 89, 89. I believe. 89. And this so what been was it like for you walking around that space uh, during that time period? Well, there were so many people there, you know, it was such a tourist event and we were allowed to take pieces of it, which we brought home. Uh, but I mean, it was amazing that we were able, he was living on the, in the Eastern sector. Um, and it was such a marked divide between the Eastern sector and the Western sector, sector at that time in 91, only two years removed from the wall coming down. Um, mm. Eastern section being much more drab, but he gave us so many stories of uh, what, had, what had happened before the wall came down and after. Uh, in a sense, he was safer, according to him, before the wall came down because um, after the wall came down, they had all these neo-Nazis and he was attacked on several occasions by neo-Nazis. Mm, mm, mm. This would have been in um, 91 uh, on his first visit to Detroit. And that on the left uh, image, that's Julia Wright who came over from Paris. I invited several people. I got their addresses mainly from the Jackson, Jim and Esther Jackson, um, including um, Julia Wright's address. And it's Ollie in the center. And that's our, uh, our mayor there. Uh, Coleman Young there on the on the right, and I think I can't see the all of the photo on the right. Uh, that's Linda, uh, Ali, uh, you, and Elton Facts. Elton Facts. Well, Elton Facts, I had known of for years, but I hadn't known at the time that he even did um, uh, cartoons. I did know that he was an artist, but he was much more well known for his um, promotion of other artists and his books on other artists. So um, when I found out that he was a great friend of Ali's and really helped him get um, some of his 
cartoons in the people's daily world, um, I invited him and, and several people came. All, uh, I would have invited anyone who knew Ali uh, to come. And all of those that I was able to get in contact with came for this event. They were just so happy to see Ali. Which, you know, most of them have, hadn't seen Ali in, uh, uh, since he left in 51. Although I think he did briefly come to the country in 72. So we really have a family album picture in the upper left. Yes, that's, uh, that's in um, the second time he came. Um, this was for, he was a keynote speaker of a cartoon festival at Ohio State University. And um, this is at that festival. He brought Ollie Jr. to, uh, uh, to come with him. And that's myself, Ollie Jr. My mother was visiting Detroit at the time. So we took her down to Columbus, Ohio. Walter, Ollie she's and, beautiful. Uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> uh, then uh, below left lower, that's Ollie. And he's sitting on the same couch that I'm sitting on now, but that's our home in the Detroit area. And here's a current picture of Ollie. Um, I think you, did you take this one? No, I uh, found that one. Um, he's, he's, in, he's in, he's uh, in journalism uh, in, uh, in Leipzig. And um, Leipzig. so you can like put his name in and you'll find a picture of him. Okay, and then there's one of Ollie's several children that Ollie, uh, except for Ollie Jr., Ollie never spent any time with um, his other children. Uh, I did know of some of them uh, the very last time he came to Detroit when he asked me to send books to them, books that um, I uh, helped publish. So this yeah, is one um, of his- uh, Professor Curtis is a really well-known um, uh, uh, professor uh, in, in Raleigh. So um, it's kind of amazing the, the, um, the permutations of the Harrington um, lineage are literally uh, all, over, all over the world. Yeah. So I'm not certain that he gave me her address, but um, I sent them to wherever he asked me to send them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the third time he came. Um, no, I'm sorry, this is still the second time where this is his address at uh, Ohio State University, and that would have been in 92. And this is, um, uh, let's see. I, I, Draper Hill, who was a, also Draper a well-known cartoonist. Now, he, he was a cartoonist for one of the Detroit papers and that's who is introducing Ali for his keynote speech. And I do have that, I have a recording of that speech mm. uh, and I have a written copy of it that he gave me. Now, so it the, was kind of nice that he was recognized towards the end of his life. Oh, incredibly. And he was very happy about that. And on the right, while he was uh, in, this is his, on his third visit, uh, he came to be artist in residence at Michigan State University, a position that I was able to uh, achieve for him. In fact, at one time before he took this position, we were talking about the whole family coming over and um, uh, Helma actually sent me her curriculum vitae to give to the folks at Michigan State. But while he was here, there was a huge convention of the NAACP and the leaders of, um, of the NAACP knew that I knew Ali and they asked if uh, I would commission him to do the cover for the booklet. Well, so Ali agreed to do it. And uh, this is the result of it. When they saw this, they decided that they didn't want to use this on this booklet. I mean, this is a booklet <laughs> that this is a convention that raised huge amount of uh, money for the NACP. I think they promoted it as being the largest in the country. Every year they would have it. And really all Ali wanted uh, was to be able to, uh, to uh, meet uh, Rosa Parks. And we all assured him that that would be no problem. Uh, she would love to meet him and he just wanted to meet her. But they didn't want to use it. So Ali didn't come to the event and neither did I. Jasmine and I are laughing because we can see why the NAACP <laughs> wouldn't want to no. use this. Not, not for the elite blacks. Uh, and I hate to say this too loudly because uh, some of them may see this uh, re um, recording. But, but that's a powerful uh, image. They, 
they actually turned it down. They would not use it on their booklet. And it's a not, and it doesn't compromise. It deals with the toughness, the challenges of, of what life was like in 1994. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and yet there, there's, I love that little dog in the middle, in the lower <laughs> center part of the picture kind of, and, 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 and it's checking everything out. This kind of dedicated to the pro proposition that all men are created equal. So there's, it's, it's ironic, which is why, you know, we're talking about him in the context of this book. Yeah. Yes, the dog is reading and taking it, <laughs> taking it all. In. And you see at the bottom, family guns at ace shops, protect yes. yours. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about <laughs> time and, and timelessness, you know. But I wanted to add in doing this commission, um, it gave me a sense of how he did his work. For instance, he, um, uh, he gave me with the commission, the Finnish commission, he gave me his sketchbook and each figure was done individually on each page of the sketchbook and sometimes two and three times. And then he did a pencil drawing of it, uh, the same size as the, uh, as the finished product. And then this is the finished product. So it gave me an entree into how he went about his work. Uh, and you can, just looking at this PowerPoint, we can kind of see the evolution of Ollie Harrington. By the time we get to the end of his career, he's doing much more cartoonish figures, but they haven't lost a kind of an edge, a kind of a, um, he's able to put in like, I'm looking at these children and their expressions on their faces and their gestures. Although their bodies are exaggerated in a cartoon way, you still get something from that. And that, that takes um, real talent and insight to do. I, I would like to know to... if this was the last work that he ever completed. Oh, it's what were really, you gonna say, it's, it's current to the time as well, right? It's as printing changes, as other practices of imaging change, he's keeping pace, you know. Yeah. Now, uh, this would have been on his uh, last trip also, I believe. When we were in Berlin, Ali made uh, paella for us. He uh, Ali was an expert cook, and um, so it was so good. I mean, I wasn't that crazy about the German fair over in Berlin, but that paella, I mean, that made the trip itself worthwhile. So when he came to um, Detroit, I, I asked him if he would uh, uh, remake that uh, paella for us, and he consented, and uh, this is the result of it. And then the he also wrote it out, wrote out his recipe over there. Uh, then he said, then pray at the bottom. But on the photo on the right lower, that's uh, Linda's, my, my mother and father-in-law, and young Ollie there in the foreground, and Ollie with an apron on, serving, serving his famous dish. Have you all made it uh, since? No, we haven't. Um, I got to... I got to check with Linda on that. We got to do this. <laughs> okay. Be believe it or not, um, I just pulled this out, you know, for this um, for this event. I hadn't seen this since he did this in in '94. Uh, oh wow! Okay. Now this was one of the most incredible um, moments of the three trips that Ali made to uh, Michigan. Um, while we were here, while he was here as artists in residence at Michigan State University, I was able to arrange an exhibition of his work at Jackson State University. And the um, uh, Margaret Walker, whom I have become very close to, I had her in Detroit at least a half dozen times. Uh, she, you know, I told her that Ollie was in town and everything, you got to bring him here because she was the link between uh, she knew Richard Wright extremely well from uh, her days and Richard Wright's days in Chicago and also her days in New York. Uh, she did not know Ollie, and, um, she, but she knew all about Ollie. I mean, she'd read every cartoon there was. So we took Ollie down there and boy, were they happy. And they had a conversation in Margaret Walker's kitchen by the way, I have to mention this. Margaret Walker lived on the same street that Meg Evers was assassinated on. Mm. Uh, their homes were on the same street, different end of the block, 
and it was on the opposite side of the street. The street is now called Margaret Walker Alexander Drive, but when Megar Evers was assassinated, it was a different name. Aside from that though, this conversation was the most amazing conversation I've ever heard between two people. Uh, I mean, you have great geniuses on either side of that conversation. Unfortunately, I did not tape it. I don't know if it would have been as great if I, if I had taped it, but it was it was an amazing conversation that they Walter, had. Walter, you know, in my short life, <laughs> I have learned that sometimes you're ready to document yes. and sometimes you're not ready to document. And there's a reason for yes. in, in the divine will that, yes. that the tape recorder is not on. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But it was amazing. And a lot of it was about Richard Wright, of course, because uh, Margaret had written a book on Richard Wright, uh, The Divine, uh, no, it was it the- uh, uh, The Demonic yeah. Genius. Yeah, Demonic Genius of Richard Wright. Um, so anyway, this was an amazing thing. But while we were there, and this is incidental because I don't think any of us knew, at least Margaret probably knew, but Ollie, Linda and I did not know that Byron De La Beckwith who had assassinated Megar Evers was convicted and on one of the days that we were down there in, nine, in um, I think it was in February of uh, 94. This is an amazing um, uh, scene here. Yeah, wow. And this is, um, uh, I know many people ask me, what is your favorite cartoon? Uh, by Ollie Harrington. Well, there's so many favorites. I mean, so very, very many favorites. Uh, but this is one because it's so timely and, and timeless. I mean, look at what's going on today. I mean, this is uh, voter restriction, you know, at its, at its peak. Um, so uh, anyway, this, is, this happens to be one of my many, many, many favorites. And uh, like you, I say, you were so, um, it was good that you purchased this piece. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which but, is... I want to make one other uh, statement about the, um, the purchasing of the, uh, some of the ones, the ones he did for the People's Daily World, they were at the time in the collection of Jim and Esther Jackson. And I bought those from him, but they told me to send the money uh, the purchase price to, um, they set the purchase price and they told me to give it to Ollie, which I had it deposited in his Berlin account. But some of the others, um, I asked Ollie if I could, if I could check with, uh, Ollie didn't get a lot of his cartoons back from the black press. So I wrote every one of them and, and I, I hired a lawyer and I had the lawyer write them. And we only got one positive response and, um, uh, we did get those a few of those cartoons. That was from the Chicago Defender. Wow, that's but remarkable. They were, they were in horrific shape. I had to send them to a paper restorer to get them restored. Yeah. I want to open it up for uh, questions from our audience and sort of start with my own question related to what you're sharing, Walter, which is. Um, what helps you? What helped you to understand the significance of collecting and supporting Ollie's work, um, particularly because he's doing satire, right? He's not painting the greats, a la Jacob Lawrence, right? There's a real pushback against um, even some black institutions like the NAACP um, nice. that takes, I think, a real satiracy as Rick gives us uh, in understanding what Ollie was up to. So could you tell us a bit about what helped you to understand? Well, um, first of all, when I started collecting, it was really so I could have art in my house, but my twin daughters, you saw the, their pictures there, they were teenagers at that time in that picture, um, that they could see because you, even though some museums like the Detroit Institute of Arts and the, and other, a few other museums, they had a few works or in some cases, many works by African-Americans, but they didn't show them. You couldn't go into a museum and see works by. So when I started collecting, uh, fortunately, I didn't limit it to just 
uh, art because to me, it's, a, it's all a, on a continuum, the art, the books, the manuscript, and the black experience. So I started collecting all of these things at the same time. And up until the time that I first witnessed Ollie Harrington's work, I had never seen cartoons that didn't present blacks in stereotype. So this was the first time. And I saw the genius right away. So, um, you know, I didn't know he was still alive until Jim and Esther told me, um, but I had to get in contact with him. And up until that time, and even beyond doing my entire time in practice in Detroit, I would invite two, at least two artists or writers a year to come to uh, Detroit. And I would share them with the Detroit community. Uh, I would take them to schools, to colleges, uh, even to elementary schools in some cases and have these people talk to the entire, and I would have receptions at, at my home for them. Uh, so there was no question about Ali. I mean, he was, he was the greatest to me in that field who was African-American and who didn't depict African-Americans in, in the funnies, in the comics, um, uh, you know, in stereotype. So there was, there was no question about it. I had to get him there if he would come. Uh, a question from an audience member. Did you get a chance to speak with any of uh, Ali's siblings from the DC area? Ali's siblings? Mm -hmm. No, I never met Ali's siblings. I knew, I knew of um, some, and I haven't looked it up. I'm sure I have the list of people that Ali told me to send um, books to because we had a book signing in 94. Um, as a matter of fact, I can give you the exact date um, because I have the uh, in I have the invitation to it right here. It was on a Sunday, January 9th, 1994. And just before that book signing, Ali signed over 100 books. And many of them were to people that I didn't know existed. So I had I have only Ali Jr is the only, in Helma, these are the only relatives that I met that were related to Holly. But I did send books to all of those that he asked me to send to. And some plays in my, in my files, which are voluminous, by the way. I mean, there are volumes of files uh, on Holly beginning in 91. Um, I, I'm sure I can find that list, but I, I've never met any, no. I know he had a sister in, in the New York area though. Being the um, art historical um, researcher that I am, <laughs> um, since we got that question, it's important for me to name the family. Um, as I said, father was Herbert Harrington. Mother yes. was Eugenia Tora Harrington. Yes. And in addition to Oliver, there is Ralph, Clarence, Ertheline, Eugenia, Uzenzi, and Herbert. So it was a big family. And, you know, I'm fascinated by the idea of this interracial family living in the Bronx at the beginning of the 20th century, how that worked. And uh, apparently, um, Ali's father didn't die until 1966, and his mother did not die until 1988. So in many respects, they were witnesses to an incredible uh, kind of arc of, 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 of his career. Do, do you know if there are any photographs or have you seen any photographs of his parents? I haven't. Nor have I. That's interesting. Uh, there's another uh, question from the audience asking uh, you, Walter, had you grown up with or studied art? What, what uh, sort of drove you to sharing your collection and supporting artists? Jasmine, um, I had to do a webinar for an organization. I'm not gonna name the organization, but the interviewer um, presented me as an artist. I can't even draw my name that you would understand it. <laughs> I, this, this, I don't know, this interviewer just, uh, he just hadn't read anything about me because he started out saying that I was an artist. 
No, I didn't grow up with uh, any art, but you know, I did have a little bit of art appreciation that uh, somehow um, uh, I didn't pay much attention to anything other than math and science when I was growing up until um, I got interested. I didn't go into an art museum until I was 19 years old at the request of a young lady um, in Philadelphia who on our first date wanted to go to the um, um, Philadelphia Museum of Art. So I went to the library and started reading up on different artists that I would see, no African-American artists, um, but you know, and she was duly impressed, but I fell in love with it. And museums have been my second home since that time. I just want to but brag no, on you, I Walter, that, that while you that. may not draw, you, <laughs> you, you know the art of communication. You know the art of interacting with people. You, you know the art of, of, of developing conversations, of connecting with people. I, I'm really moved when you say, I just didn't collect art. I collected people's letters. Uh, I invited them in, I commissioned them. That takes, you in a, that takes you in another plane than most people who are just about collecting things. You, you seem to be someone or you are someone who is genuinely interested in the culture and, and the creator and the creative process and, and, and their lives. Uh, so, so, so that puts you, that makes you special. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, I, did, uh, I did try to commission every artist or writer that uh, I ever met and most of them agree, you know, Richard Hunt, Lawrence, Bearden, Catlett, um, um, you know, most of them, most of them, I was probably closest in terms of writers, I was probably closest to other than Margaret Walker to Sterling Brown. And uh, we became very close. He was one of the earliest people that I invited to. Uh, and I tried to commission him to do some things, but his mind just wasn't with it. Um, and he almost did a commission for me in terms of writing. A related question uh, we have here is, how can we support the labor of Black artists and ensure their legacy in the history of art for those of us who, who can't yet afford to collect? Oh, uh, boy. I mean, you can support it by learning about it, really, and doing as I did, studying. You know, when I started learning about art, when I went to my first art museum, um, I had to go to the library which fortunately was in the next block from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And I went in there and I spent days in there. I mean, learning and reading about it and going to uh, exhibitions and going to museums. Uh, that is one of, that's the earliest thing you can do. But, uh, and, and um, I mean, if you can't afford it, I mean, there are ways that you, you certainly can afford the, the books, um, if not, you know, if not first edition of the um, uh, of the early uh, works, but you certainly can't afford the books. And with uh, artwork, I mean, uh, there are prints that you might want to buy, which have some of the same images as the original works. I mean, prints are original works in and of themselves. Walter, I want to so add to you, what you, you said. Might, you may want to tune in to that yourself, uh, 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 Rick. Well, what I was going to say is um, you also do your homework. And um, in other words, a lot of people collect on a primary level, but you read about the artists. You gather as much information as you can about the artists. You do research and you look at the breadth of what somebody's created. So you're an informed um, um, uh, collector, let's put it that way. And that's something to be said about that, you know, that, that, that you're not just looking, you're looking because you know, you know, what, what, what the body of the work is like. And a lot of that comes from having conversations with the artists, um, which you've done, but you've also done your homework. And, and, um, and, and I think that, that even with your work that is connected to like Frederick Douglass and your archives, you, you read deeply and, and you have 
mastered kind of the art of, of kind of um, deep knowledge about the culture, which makes you um, an informed um, collector. And it means that, that when things pop up at auction or if something pops up in a secondhand store, you know what you're looking at. I try to, thank you. Yes, yeah, studying before the date is a, a quite impressive tidbit. <laughs> we, we have another question here about Schuyler's Black No More mm -hmm. uh, and how various folks responded to it. Uh, the question is, what is the overall track record of affirmations of Harrington's witty knowing satires of celebrated Black folks and racement institutions? How did, how, how is he received um, at the time by his peers. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my sense of it, I mean, that, that even as a young man working for, for the Amsterdam News and ultimately extending that talent to the Pittsburgh Courier, the People's Voice, the Chicago Defender, trying to develop a syndicated uh, contract to have the works being seen widely with many, um, um, black newspapers. Um, there clearly was a there was a desire for that kind of material uh, in the early uh, mid 20th century. I mean, let's face it, we're now at a moment where we have so much access to internet and all sorts of publications, but go back to the 30s, go back to the 40s when it was very limited what, 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 what was in the media that was available that expressed our stories as African Americans, and so and so black newspapers were really important for African Americans, and therefore the writers and the and the cartoonists, you know, had a certain kind of um, uh, uh, position, uh, and and clearly um, uh, Ali Harrington's Bootsy cartoons, um, as I say in the book, they start off being called dark laughter, and then by the fifties he changes the name to Bootsy. But 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 they but throughout this whole time period, there's a real appreciation for him. So I would say that in some ways he's more renowned uh, in terms of the masses of Black people than Jacob Lawrence or or Elizabeth Catlett um, um, were at that time period because he's doing cartoons that are reaching many many people and and um, and he's able to maintain that reputation even abroad because. As Walter says, he's sending his cartoons from Paris in the in the 50s uh, and in the 60s and 70s and 80s. He's sending the, the uh, cartoons to newspapers and magazines um, in the U.S. Um, from Berlin. So so in some ways, he has a track record. He has a reputation. Uh, maybe we don't know much about him um, um, post um, his his active career, but but that's why folks like. Me, I try to, I want to tell the story because I think this is somebody who, whose story needs to be told. I concur. I'm wondering as we um, move towards closing out, if there's something, uh, especially from you, Walter, that you'd like us to know about Ollie that perhaps we don't know. Oh, <laughs> um, Ali, um, I'm trying to not say anything too, too personal because, you know, there were a few personal things that came up, but um, uh, let's put it like this. I'm not going to say so much about Ali um, that you may not know, but I will say that I did gift the majority of the cartoons in my collection to Yale University, to the Beinecke really at Yale. And they will definitely, it was in, a, it was in my contract of, on the gift that they will do an exhibition up there and it will probably be within the next year. And similarly, there's going to be, I think, I don't have a contract on it, but an exhibition of his work at the Billy Ireland uh, Museum of Cartoon Art, which is in Columbus, Ohio, part of Ohio State University. And it would have already happened uh, in Columbus, 
except for the pandemic. So um, I told you one of the things that most people wouldn't have known doing this talk that Ollie was quite, a, quite the cook. But there are some other things too, but they're a little more personal and I, I don't want to delve into those. Well, since I didn't know him, <laughs> one of the things that I think I, I, I discovered uh, in the course of my research, and, and I kind of pretty much said a little bit about it already, is that um, he was really an important figure in the 20th century. And, you know, I, that sounds really glib or it sounds, you know, like hyperbole. But when you really think about, you know, his life and his contributions, and, and the people that he touched and interacted with um, over the course of, 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 of several decades, you really are telling a story about um, the United States. You're telling a story about modernism. You're telling a story about, um, about art and politics and, and, and taking a stand. Um, but you're also telling a story about how art uh, can do interesting things that don't necessarily, um, that, that are not apparent to you on the surface. I'm, I guess I'm back to those cartoons, Jasmine, of, of the civil rights stories that he told in cartoons, the, um, the, the, the images of the, the, the black boy running. You know, I mean, he taught me as an art historian, the power of of, of, of art as, as an ironic vehicle for, her, for, for sharing deeper truths about who we are and, and, and the world that we live in. And, and that's why I put him up there alongside all of the other important African-American kind of art luminaries um, that, that Walter has collected and that, and that we teach in, in our classes. Um, Ali Harrington certainly needs to be a part of, of our canon. For sure. And I think that, you know, your book certainly gives us a chance to know him better, you know. Um, and Walter, I think you, you did answer the question in telling us to go see more of his work when it's uh, on yeah. display at the Beinecke um, and at Ohio State. I think one of the things I admire about your way of collecting is that you give us the person uh, through their work and then pieces of them in their own voice, this sort of textured fabric of their lives beyond uh, the, the illustration. So, so thank you for that. And thank you to Rick for uh, a wonderful work that really um, has something for everyone um, and shows us the richness of uh, Black satire. There is a code in the chat um, for getting, for purchasing going there uh, Black Visual Satire from Yale University Press. Um, thank you to Rick for sharing, for producing the work and for sharing. And thank you to Walter for um, a, just a wonderful example about the richness of collecting uh, and, the, and the gift of Ollie's work all put together in one place. So thank you to you both. And thank you all for joining us uh, for Faculty Book Watch. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. And thank you, Rick. Thank you.